With this new evidence, the police released me and attempted to arrest Catherine, who fought back. She managed to give a few cops black eyes, but that only made them even more upset with her, and while she had a lot of fight in her, they still overpowered her and hit her with their clubs until she finally stopped resisting. Have you ever met someone that put on a face that was incredibly convincing that they hid who they really were? Well, for me, that was my mother-in-law, although I wasn't the only person that she had fooled, though. Let me explain, though. My name is Cassandra, and I have been married to my husband, Brad, for close to seven years. His mother, Catherine, had always been very kind and had always really been wonderful to me. The first time that she met me, she told me that she loved me like a daughter. It really made me feel wanted and appreciated, and at the time, I just took it at face value. Thankfully, I got along just as well with Brad's sisters, and I was incredibly happy to be a part of his family. The first time that something came up that made me question her true feelings was a year after Brad and I had been married. My mother-in-law and I had been out shopping and she found this gorgeous little black dress. Oh, this dress is gorgeous and it fits me so well. And it's on sale too. You definitely need to get it. But all I have is my credit card and my husband will be angry if I buy it. That's such a shame. Well, I can lend you $50 so you can buy it and pay me back when you can. Are you sure? Of course. We're family. It didn't feel like a bad idea at the time, as I had just assumed that after a few weeks that she would pay me back. But a few months passed, and she hadn't given me a dime. Sure, it was only $50, but at the same time, it was the principle of the matter. And so I finally broke down and asked her about it. Hey, I was just wondering. When do you think that you can get that $50 back to me? It's okay if you don't have it at the moment. What $50? The $50 that I lent you to buy that black dress that we found that was on sale a few months back. I don't remember ever buying a black dress. We bought it together and you said you couldn't use your credit card because your husband would be angry with you for buying it. Oh, I remember, but I ended up buying it with my card. I didn't know what to say, no matter how I phrased it. She wouldn't admit that she had borrowed the money. Again, it wasn't like I needed the money, but knowing that she was just ignoring the fact that she owed me the money annoyed me. Since we were family, I chose to just let things go though, as I didn't see a point in trying to push it, especially since it was such a little amount of money. It was more important to just forgive and forget to keep the peace. That is until one night, where both Brad and I had to work late. Thankfully, Catherine was available to watch our children, and so I thought that I would help her out as a way to thank her, and I offered to buy her and our kids dinner and so I gave her my debit card so that she could pay for whatever they ordered. That night, when we got home, we found that she had ordered pizza for herself and the kids, and she gave me back my card, and I thought that that was the end of it. I was incredibly grateful that she was available to help us out like that. A month later, I went to use the microwave, and it died on me. It was incredibly annoying, but it was just a microwave, and so I decided that after I dropped my children off at school, that I would head down to the local appliance store and buy a new one. I had spoken to my husband about it, and we had agreed that we wouldn't buy the cheapest one that they had, instead that we would buy one that is higher in value and hopefully would last longer. At any rate, I went down to the store and picked out one that I thought would be a perfect fit for us. But, when I went to pay for it, my card was declined. Confused, I then paid for it with one of my credit cards and headed home to speak with Brad to figure out what had gone wrong. When I got home, though, one of my sister-in-law's, Emma, was there speaking to my husband. Hey, Han, there was a problem with the debit card today. It got declined. Yeah, the same thing happened when I tried to buy lunch earlier today. What kind of new microwave did you buy today? N don't worry, the one that I picked out wasn't too expensive, but I didn't even get a chance to pay for it, since my card said that it was overdrawn. It was so embarrassing. Wait a minute, your card was declined too? Can I ask you an odd question? Of course. Well, my card was also declined today, and I think I may know the reason why, but if I'm right, then that would be pretty bad. What do you mean? Just say it. Well, did mom ever borrow your debit card, or did you ever give her your card number and pin to her for any reason? Yeah, we did. We gave it to her so that she could order food for herself and the kids while we were gone one night. Why? Because I'm pretty sure that she is the reason that both of our bank accounts are empty. She has a serious spending problem. I would go so far as to say that she is addicted to buying things. 
And they aren't even always useful things for that matter. Are you saying that mom stole from us? Yes, and it isn't even the first time that she has done it either. She stole over $5,000 from Terry and Michael just over a year ago, too. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Apparently, this was something of an issue that everyone in Brad's family had known about for years. Terry, Brad's eldest sister, had only been the most reasoned victim. That is, until she stole from Emma, Brad, and I. When she had weaseled her way out of paying me the $50 that she owed me, I had been irritated, but our bank account had well over $12,500 in it, and she had stolen it all. I could only see red, and knowing that she had taken it, I rushed over to her house to confront her. Catherine, I can't believe that you stole from me, or from your own family for that matter. You know that you need to give that money back immediately, right? I have no idea what you're talking about, but you should be very careful before going around and spreading such rumors. If they aren't rumors, then you won't mind proving that you don't have the money for my account. Although you've probably already spent it. As I was talking to her, she was literally wearing fancy new clothes that still had their price tags attached to them and none of them were less than $100. There were also several shopping bags behind her on the floor, and I didn't have to guess that all of those items were bought with mine and Emma's money. I can't believe that you would accuse me of something so terrible. Get out of my house now. I didn't know what else to do, and so for the moment, I left. I needed to talk to Brad and come up with a way to confront Catherine again, and to be able to get her to return our money to us. There had to be a way of reaching her, but on my way home, I was pulled over by the police and they arrested me. Catherine had called them and reported that I had stolen thousands of dollars from her, and that when she had had enough and confronted me, that I had threatened to kill her if she went to the police. Of course it wasn't true, but her story was convincing especially since when they had looked at my bank account, that the amount of money she had accused me of taking was there. She had used my debit card number to log into my internet banking account and deposited the money to frame me. I later had found out that she had made copies of my debit card, as well as Emma's, which was how she was able to access my bank account, both to steal my money, but also to try to frame me. She had been doing that for years and had perfected the creation of them so much so that the ones that she made were indistinguishable from the cards that the bank provided. I pleaded with the police to believe me when I said that I didn't take the money and that it was actually her that had stolen from me and not the other way around. They just wouldn't listen to me and they threw me into a jail cell. Hours later, though, my husband came to get me. He and his father had spoken to the police and had helped to set things straight. Once Brad hadn't heard from me in a while, he went to his parents' house and found out that my mother-in-law had framed me for the theft of not only Emma's money, but the money that she had stolen from her friends as well. So not only was she stealing from family, but she was also stealing from her closest friends. With this new evidence, the police released me in an attempt to arrest Catherine who fought back. She managed to give a few cops black eyes, but that only made them even more upset with her, and while she had a lot of fight in her, they still overpowered her and hit her with their clubs until she finally stopped resisting. As it turned out, the main reason that she had fled was because this wasn't her first time being charged with theft and the police weren't going to be lenient on her. She was charged with grand theft and for filing a wrongful charge against me, neither of which on their own would land her a significant amount of jail time. But since this wasn't her first offense and the fact that other people were coming forward and charging her as well, the case against her really began to add up. In the end, she was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Since she no longer had any of the money that she had taken, the courts forced my father-in-law to sell everything that she had ever bought with stolen money in order to pay people back. It really didn't cover all of it, but it was enough that people felt a sense of justice. After that, my father-in-law was furious with Catherine, and he divorced her while she was in prison, and then placed a restraining order against her, so that once she got out, so that she couldn't return home. As far as he was concerned, she had made way too many bad decisions, and he had no intentions of including her in his life anymore. It was kind of sad, but at the same time she had made some terrible choices, and now had to deal with the consequences. It's kind of sad that she was so willing to throw away so much for such a silly reason but some people do some really crazy things. When I had first met her, I could never have foreseen that this was the real person and that the nice version of her had been the mask the whole time. Their house was very dilapidated and looked like it was seconds away from falling apart. 
Once Tobias parked the car, he then pulled my luggage out of the trunk and threw it to the ground and began to violently search through it until he found my passport. Once he did, he scooped it up and put it in pocket. Hey, that's mine. What are you doing? Quiet, silly girl. You belong to us now, and without this, you won't be able to run away. Patricia gave you up for adoption when you were a baby without my knowing, but now we have you back, and you are our property. I tried to reach out and grab the passport from him, and he easily shoved me away and then slapped me so hard that I... Hello there. My name is Jessica, and the past two years have been quite the roller coaster. I doubt what happened to me would happen to most people. But I want to tell you my story so that just in case hearing my story might help someone else. So let me start off by saying that I had pretty much always known that I was adopted. My parents had always felt that I should know this fact, but also that they loved me more than anything else in the world, and that they felt that adopting me was the best decision that they had ever made. They had adopted me when I was very young, and so they had been the only parents that I had ever known. And honestly, I had a very happy childhood. That is, until I turned 14. There was a terrible accident. My parents were on a yacht that belonged to a friend of theirs, and during a sudden and unexpected storm, the ship sank and they drowned. The whole experience scarred me and gave me an irrational fear of the water. After the funeral, my mother's sister Cecilia took me in and did her best to fill the void that had been left when my parents passed away. Thankfully, she was just as lovely as my mother had been, and I truly did love and appreciate everything that she was doing for me at the time, but the whole experience had opened up something in me. It made me realize that life was short and I wanted to know more about where I had come from. And so I began to do some investigative research to who my birth parents were. Are you sure you want to know who they are? You might not like what you find out. That is a possibility, but yeah. I would rather know that they are awful people than never know a thing about them. I don't know why, but it's just something that I have to do. Well, I'm here to support you no matter what happens. Just don't forget that no matter what you find out, that you always have a home here with me. I love you, Jessica, and I only want the best for you. My aunt was absolutely amazing. And more than once, I questioned whether I was doing the right thing or if I should just give up and accept that my birth parents had given me up and that my life was just separate from theirs. However, something made me keep looking. As a teenager, I didn't have a lot of resources as I didn't have money to hire a private investigator or anything, but I was pretty handy when it came to finding things on the internet, and I used a message board and against all odds, I managed to find my birth parents. As it turned out, they were looking for me as well and had posted some information about my adoption on the message board. Of course, I was careful as I suspected that it might be a scam. And so I told my aunt and we then privately messaged them to make sure that they were who they claimed to be. And they knew everything about my adoption, including where I was adopted from, who adopted me and all of my medical history as well. Once I knew who they were, I began chatting with them every day and we started to develop a bond. Things were going so well, in fact, that they invited me to come visit them during my summer break from school. They lived in another country, and the thought of going on a trip for the summer to a faraway land sounded exciting. The only real snag was that my aunt would be unable to come with me as her job wouldn't allow her to take her vacation during the summer, as it was her busy season, but she did agree to let me go. Once the school year ended, I packed my bags and got on a plane bound for Greece. I knew that I should have slept on the flight there, but I was so excited that I just couldn't fall asleep. When I landed, I was greeted by my birth parents and found out their names were Tobias and Patricia. It felt awkward at first to finally meet them face to face, but that didn't last long. My mother threw her arms around me and kissed me dozens of times. We then got into their car and drove through the countryside until we arrived at their home, which was pretty remote. They even had a makeshift drawbridge that crossed a river that surrounded their property. I could tell that they really valued their privacy. Once we pulled up in front of their house though, I had a sinking feeling come over me and I began to get worried. Their house was very dilapidated and looked like it was seconds away from falling apart. Once Tobias parked the car, he then pulled my luggage out of the trunk and threw it to the ground and began to violently search through it until he found my passport. Once he did, he scooped it up and put it in pocket. Hey, that's mine. What are you doing? Quiet, silly girl. You belong to us now, and without this, 
you won't be able to run away. Patricia gave you up for adoption when you were a baby without my knowing, but now we have you back and you are our property. I tried to reach out and grab the passport from him, and he easily shoved me away and then slapped me so hard that I fell to the ground. Looking up at Patricia, I hoped that she would defend me, but she looked down at me on the ground and smiled. Don't try anything foolish. The river that surrounds our home is very fast and you will drown if you try to cross it. And should you talk back or disobey us, being slapped is the least of your worries. I had no idea what was going on, but I quickly learned that I needed to be careful what I said around them. After they stole my passport, they dragged me inside and showed me to a small room that had a straw mattress and a thin burlap sheet for a blanket but no pillow. Aside from that, the room was empty. That night I tried to sleep, but it was so cold and the straw offered no comfort at all. As soon as the sun came up, they put me to work. In the morning, they had me cleaning the entire house and preparing meals for the day. And in the afternoon, they had me doing yard work, clearing out the weeds from the garden and even chopping firewood. When the sun finally set, I was beyond exhausted, and Tobias locked me in my new bedroom. I had been planning on searching the home for a phone or a computer once Tobias and Patricia went to bed, but with the door locked, I was unable to do a search. The next day was the same, and the day after that, and the day after that. I was convinced that I was going to be living this nightmare for the rest of my life. Since I had no other options, I decided to try to have a talk with Patricia and appeal to her maternal instincts. I waited until I was alone with her and was sure that Tobias wouldn't overhear us. Hey, Patricia, why are you and Tobias doing this to me? You are our child, and as such, you need to do as we say. You were gone for 15 years and have a lot of work to make up for. But how am I supposed to do that? Plus, you were the one to give me up. I never chose for you to put me up for adoption. It was a mistake, but we will make you work hard until it is time for you to be married. Married? I have no plans of getting married. No, but we do. We have arranged to sell you to a wealthy family to marry their son. He is coming over in a few days to see you. After that, the two of you will be married and we will be wealthy. We will use the money to renovate or buy a new house and then some savings for some stuffs I can't tell you. For now, keep working or else you will be forced to see your future husband while having a black eye and a split lip. I knew that her threat was all too real, and the idea that all this was just a ruse to get me in their hands just so they could sell me off was revolting, although it did give me a plan. There was no way of knowing if it would work, and it would mean that I would have to face a fear that had plagued me since my parents passed away when I was a child. I wish I could say that the days passed by quickly, but they were grueling and hard. But the morning came when I was to meet my future husband, and as I braced myself for another hard day's worth of work. Patricia unlocked and opened the door to my room. In her hands, she had a pretty purple dress. Put this dress on. Malcolm will be here soon to make sure that you are worth marrying, and you better put on a good act. If he doesn't marry you, we shall make sure that you regret ever being born. All I could do was nod my head and agree and hope that my plan would work. Once I was dressed, I was led outside and introduced to Malcolm, who turned out to be a middle-aged, heavyset man. The way that he leered at me made me feel very uncomfortable. It was obvious that he rather liked how I looked, and, considering our age differences, it sent a shiver up my spine. Okay, you two lovebirds go for a walk and talk and get to know each other. We keep an eye on you from a distance, though. Malcolm walked over and offered me his arm so that he could lead me around. Against my better judgment, I accepted his offer and wrapped my arm around his and let him lead me away from the house. As we walked, he kept shifting his arm around to touch me. At first, he just rubbed my arm, but slowly he began rubbing my back and moving his arm slowly downwards. Before he could truly harass me, I made my move. Um, Malcolm, do you think we could walk closer to the river? I find being near the water very romantic. Of course, my dear. I would spend time with such a lovely creature as you anywhere. He steered me towards the river, and as soon as we were close to the riverbank, he pulled me in close and tried to kiss me. He was so incredibly strong, but there was no way that I was going to let those monsters marry me off to this disgusting man. As he leaned in, I thrust my knee as hard as I could into his crotch, but rather than make my break at that moment, I need him a second time just to be sure. As he toppled to the ground, writhing in pain, I punched him in the face just for good measure before turning towards the river and running at full force. 
The thought of trying to swim across the water terrified me, but only half as much as staying and getting married to Malcolm. As I ran out into the water, I was surprised to find that it was only a foot deep, and as I waded across, it never got any deeper. Either it was an unseasonably dry time of year, or Tobias and Patricia had been bluffing about the river. At any rate, I made it across and then ran down the road as quickly as I could. I had seen a house down the road when they had first brought me here, and I ran towards it as fast as I could go and was relieved when I made it there before they managed to catch up to me. Once inside, I spoke to the family who thankfully spoke English and told them what had happened to me. The mother of the family quickly phoned the police who showed up within 10 minutes. There were several police cars and while one stayed with me to take my statement, the others raced down the road towards Patricia and Tobias's home. I later found out that the police had only arrived just in time to prevent Tobias, Patricia, and Malcolm from fleeing. All three were arrested on the spot. When they went to court though, Malcolm received the lightest sentence since he hadn't actually done anything, but he had still attempted to marry a minor, and he was sentenced to a year in prison and over a thousand hours of community service. As for Patricia and Tobias, they were sentenced to prison for life. Among their charges were kidnapping, abuse of a minor, trafficking of a minor, and attempting to resist arrest. Apparently both of them wouldn't let the police handcuff them, and they fought back and were only subdued when the police used their stun guns on them. After that, I was finally able to return home to be with my aunt, who blamed herself for letting me go, although it wasn't even remotely her fault. After all, how were we supposed to know what kind of monsters those terrible people were? And there you have it. That's my story, and I hope by telling it that I might just help someone out. Be careful out there. Sometimes the least likely people are the worst monsters. Just then, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach and I dropped to the floor. I was going into labor. Chris, I'm going into labor now. You need to drive me to the hospital. No. If you're so sure I'm cheating on you, then that's what I'll do. Maybe this will teach you a lesson on snooping. And just like that, Chris walked out on me as I was going into labor with our child. Hi, my name is Tracy, and boy do I have a traumatic story to tell you. I had this boyfriend, named Chris, who at the time seemed to be the best guy you could possibly imagine. We met at work, where I worked as a nurse and he as a doctor. Things were going amazing, like really amazing. So amazing that I got pregnant out of the blue, and we both decided we needed to keep it, as we both despised the idea of abortion. We agreed to get married after the baby was born an idea that would come in handy later on. One day, I was over Chris's house getting ready for a movie date. He was in the shower and I was putting on my makeup when I heard a knock at the door. I answered the door and was met with a middle-aged woman wearing inappropriate lingerie. She seemed shocked to see me and became very embarrassed. Who the hell are you? Uh, pizza delivery, wrong house, sorry. What the? The woman ran back to her car and drove off. She was obviously lying about the pizza, and it really threw me off. When Chris got out of the shower, I questioned him about this awkward encounter. Ha ha, yay. That's really weird. I have no idea what that was about. He seemed really nervous and kept scratching his head. The next couple of days, I couldn't get this incident out of my head, and I decided I needed to get to the bottom of it. The next time I was at Chris's house, I waited until he went to the bathroom, and I went through his phone. To my surprise... It looked clean, until I saw an app I didn't recognize. It was a secret picture app, and I began to go through it. To my horror and shock, there were hundreds of X-rated pictures and videos of my boyfriend and that same middle-aged woman who had been at his house a few days earlier. I struggled to hold my tears back, as I screenshotted and sent myself some of the most incriminating ones as evidence, and then tried to continue to act calm for the rest of the night. However, my anxiety got the best of me, and I burst out yelling after we had dinner at his place. Eh, I know you're cheating on me. What? What do you mean? That woman who showed up the other day, she's your mistress. I saw all the pictures and videos. You evil pig, you went through my phone? I think what you did was much worse. I mean, we're about to have a baby together. Just then, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach and I dropped to the floor. I was going into labor. 
Chris, I'm going into labor now. You need to drive me to the hospital. No. If you're so sure I'm cheating on you, then that's what I'll do. Maybe this will teach you a lesson on snooping. And just like that, Chris walked out on me as I was going into labor with our child. I knew right then and there that I was not going to marry that evil man. I took out my phone and called my older brother, who rushed to get me and take me to the hospital. He was there for me the whole time, and my parents came too to keep me company. After several hours, I finally gave birth to a beautiful baby boy, and I named him Brady after my great-grandfather. I tried calling Chris, but he just ignored all of my calls. I knew he was with that middle-aged woman, probably cheating on me as I sat there with our son. When I finally went home, my parents and brother questioned me on my Chris had not shown face. I wanted to make an excuse for him, but I decided to come clean about what was going on. My parents became furious, and my brother became completely irate. He had always been protective of me, and I had never seen him so mad before in my life. He immediately began plotting with me on how we would take revenge. Me and my family talked, and I decided that I wanted nothing to do with Chris anymore, but he wasn't going to get off that easy. Finally, Chris called me back and told me he was ready to see his son. I decided I would hide a microphone on my body so I could record our conversation and hopefully get some more evidence. We met at his house, and I brought Brady along. As soon as he saw his son, he immediately started saying horrible things. It was like his whole personality changed now that I had discovered he was a cheater. Brady? What an ugly name. I can't be that surprised when his mother is as ugly as you. You know you used to be kind of hot, but now you're just fat, and it made you ugly. How can you be so horrible to me? I thought you loved me. Nope, I never did. That's why I've been cheating since almost day one. I couldn't stand it anymore, so I ran away crying. When I got home, I showed my family the voice recording of the confession from Chris, along with the X-rated pictures and videos to go with it. My brother took all of this in and calmly told me he had a plan. The next day, we called all of Chris's friends and relatives and told them they would need to show their faces at our house that night for an intervention for Chris. We lied and told them that Chris was struggling with a drug addiction and that he desperately needed this intervention as a wake-up call. Almost all of the people we called agreed to come show their support, including his parents, grandparents, siblings, his boss, all of his best friends, and even some of his best friend's wives. That night, they all piled into our living room and we sat in a circle and waited for the next part of the plan. I went into the other room and called Chris. I told him he needed to come over immediately because there was a problem with Brady. Chris rushed over and bolted inside, only to be met with a sea of people from his life. What the hell is going on here? Chris, you're going to want to sit down. Chris sat down, and I began to tell the whole story. I confessed to my lies and told everyone that they were not there because of Chris's imaginary drug problem, but they were there to bear witness to how much of a scumbag Chris truly is. I told them everything, about the cheating, about the emotional abuse, and about how he ditched me as I was going into labor. Then I laid the evidence on them. I showed them all of the X-rated pictures and videos I had and played the voice recording for them as well. Just then, a man started yelling from his seat. It was Chris's best friend and he had noticed something horrible. He realized that the woman in the X-rated pictures and videos was his own wife, meaning his best friend had betrayed him. You are the worst person I've ever met. I knew something was going on. You ruined my life. The man ran out crying. Next, Chris's boss stood up and fired Chris in front of all of us. I can't imagine the thought of facing you again at work. You are fired, effective immediately. Chris's boss stormed out, slamming the door behind him. Then, Chris's grandparents stood up and told Chris that they were unbelievably disappointed in him and that they never wanted to see him again. They told him that they no longer thought of him as family, and they too walked out. Chris's parents were the next to confront him. Son, you clearly have a lot to work through. Me and your father are no longer a part of your life and you are no longer our son. Please never contact us again. Goodbye. Chris stood up and dropped to his knees and he began to sob violently. I couldn't help but laugh in his face. And me, my brother, my mom and dad all had a hearty laugh. This isn't fair. You ugly cow. You can't just ruin my entire life from one little mistake. Chris began charging at me full speed with his fist in the air, ready to hit me. 
My brother jumped out in front of him and smashed him in the face. He immediately collapsed to the ground with a clearly broken nose. My family stood over him with smiles on our faces and told him exactly what was going to happen next. We told him that he was going to begin child support payments starting tomorrow for double the max amount. We told him that if he refused or if he missed a payment, then we would release his little videos and pictures to the world, forever putting shame on him and his mistress's name. If those got out, he would never be able to work again. We told him that these payments were to continue until Brayden was 18, and until then he would have zero contact with his son. But, but, he's my son, I want to see him. Too bad, you had your chance at a happy family and you ruined it. Chris grappled with the thought of his life being over, but ultimately decided his best course of action would be to agree to my demands. He had to work extremely hard as a doctor, but almost all of his paycheck went directly to me and my son, leaving him with almost nothing. I hear he now lives in the worst part of town with three drug addict roommates and often goes hungry as he is unable to feed himself. As for his mistress, well, she was kicked out of her house by her husband and is now homeless. Hey, maybe the two of them can live together under a bridge one day after Chris retires and is left with nothing. Do you think I'm being too harsh? Or do you think my master plan worked perfectly? Do you think he deserved it? That's the problem, Mrs. Langston. Lindsay confided in me that when she and her stepfather are alone together, he, he touches her inappropriately, and he tells her to keep it a secret so neither one of them will get into trouble. My name is Kate, and I'm 35 years old. I'm a mother to an eight-year-old daughter, Lindsay. I had her during my marriage to my ex-husband, which only lasted a few years. Frederick had started out as a loving guy, and I was sure he was my soulmate. I we met just after I graduated from college when I bumped into him in a coffee shop. I didn't see him as I turned to leave and we collided, making me spill my coffee all over him. Frederick was understanding about what happened and even bought another coffee for me. After that, we ended up staying in the coffee shop, talking for hours. He was fascinating. At the time, he'd just gotten a job as a veterinary assistant and he would tell me about all the animals that he'd help examine and treat. I loved to hear about his work, and I especially loved the way he would light up when talking to me about it. He had a passion for helping animals, and I couldn't help admiring that part of him. After a few years of dating, Frederick proposed to me, and I said yes. We were married later that year, and 12 months after that, I became pregnant with Lindsay. At the time, I couldn't have been any happier. Frederick and I had been talking about starting a family of our own for a few months at that point, and when I found out that we were having a baby, I knew I was ready to become a mother. I broke the news to Frederick that night, and he took the news well. Honey? Yes, dear. I have some very exciting news for you. Well, what is it? Don't keep me in suspense. I'm pregnant. We're going to be parents. You're pregnant? Yes. That's wonderful. This is exactly what we've been preparing for. That night he kissed me and held me tight, and we stayed up half the night going over baby names we liked. Throughout my pregnancy, Frederick was there at my side, making sure I was healthy and that all of my needs were met. He attended every doctor's appointment with me and every day we both got more and more excited. I was healthy for all nine months, and one day my water finally broke, I was ecstatic except my excitement disappeared when I couldn't get a hold of Frederick. He'd gone into work that morning and told me to call if anything happened. He promised me he would pick up the phone as long as he wasn't treating a patient. But when I called, the secretary said that he had never arrived at the building. I was worried about him, but I had to think about getting to the hospital since I was going into labor. So I called one of my friends to drive me. Hours later, after our sweet baby girl was born, there was still no sign of Frederick. I was beginning to worry about him. Since giving birth, my friend had gone outside and tried to call him multiple times, all with no success. Then a police officer walked into my hospital room and immediately I got a sinking feeling in my stomach. Are you Kate Langston? Yes. What are you doing here, officer? Ma'am, I'm very sorry to have to tell you that your husband, Frederick Langston, was killed in a car crash earlier today. When I heard that, it felt like my whole world had shattered. 
It was the most difficult challenge of my life to have to continue on without my husband and the father of our child. I loved Lindsay and it was my greatest joy to raise her, but it was also the most difficult thing I had to do by myself. At times, it felt like I was completely alone, even with my friends stopping by to help sometimes. It took a few years before it felt like I could breathe again and talk to Lindsay about her father without wanting to cry. After Lindsay turned 12, my friend Christine introduced me to my current husband, Jeremy. He was friendly and wanted kids of his own, so she thought we would make a good match and that having another person to parent Lindsay would make things easier for me and my daughter. Jeremy and I got along well, and having him in the house did help alleviate some of the stress of parenting, not to mention how well he got along with Lindsay. On nights I had to work late, Jeremy would stay with Lindsay and make sure she was taken care of, and oftentimes would spend as much of his free time as he could bonding with her. With the comfort I felt being around him, and the way he got along with my daughter, I couldn't help accepting his marriage proposal. That was about the same time I started to notice some changes in Lindsay, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. After our wedding, I started to notice Lindsay's grades slipping and she began to grow more and more quiet and reserved. She started to drift away from the sweet and friendly little girl that I'd raised. At the time, I thought that maybe she was being bullied in school, so I approached her teacher and asked how the other students had been treating her. Only the teacher, Ms. Parker, said that Lindsay, before she'd started shutting people out, was friendly with a lot of the students. Most of the class was able to get along with her and the rest didn't mind Lindsay. I was at a loss. I didn't know what was going on with Lindsay and how to help. So one night I went into her room after dinner and asked her, Lindsay, honey, is there something going on? <laughs> Lindsay wouldn't look me in the eyes and didn't answer my question. She didn't say anything at all. Whatever was happening, she wasn't comfortable telling me about it. And while that broke my heart, I decided not to push the issue. I told Jeremy about my concerns, and he immediately reassured me that I shouldn't be worried. It's all right, sweetheart. Maybe Lindsay just has some kind of learning disability, and it's making her self-conscious. It's nothing to be scared about. Jeremy made a good point, so the next day I started looking into getting an appointment with a specialist to see if Lindsay had some kind of learning disorder. A few days later, the doctor could see us. So after Jeremy left for work, I brought Lindsay in and waited for the doctor to talk to me. After a few hours, the doctor invited me into his office and sat me down. What he said next completely shocked me. Mrs. Langston, after a thorough examination, I found that Lindsay does not have a learning disability. Oh, that's wonderful. But then, what's going on with her? Why is she quiet and not doing well in school? That's what I really need to speak to you about. The reason Lindsay isn't doing well in school and is shutting people out is because of her stepfather. What? Jeremy? That's not true. He adores Lindsay. He spends as much time with her as he can. He helps her with all of her homework and tucks her into bed at night. That's the problem, Mrs. Langston. Lindsay confided in me that when she and her stepfather are alone together, he, he touches her inappropriately and he tells her to keep it a secret so neither one of them will get into trouble. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. My husband had been molesting my daughter. I almost didn't want to believe it, but I did for Lindsay's sake. As awful as I felt hearing about it, she was the one suffering and I had to put her well-being over my feelings. Is, is there anything I can do to help Lindsay? The doctor advised me to take Lindsay to the hospital so a couple of doctors could examine her and to find a therapist that she could talk to. He also provided me with several resources for family members of abuse victims to help me help my daughter. He also told me it would be beneficial to keep Jeremy and Lindsay separate. I was way ahead of him there. I had absolutely no intention of allowing that bastard near my child anymore. For now, I would be able to stay at a friend's place with Lindsay. She would keep it a secret where we were so we wouldn't have to worry about him trying to find us and bring us back to the house. A few days later, I was searching for a good divorce lawyer and stumbled across the page of Jeremy's ex-girlfriend. He'd mentioned her a couple weeks into our relationship and he made her out to be some kind of villain. Back then, he seemed trustworthy enough that I never questioned him. Of course, I knew better now. Sorry. I scrolled through her page and found out that she also had a daughter. I wondered if Jeremy had abused her too, so I reached out. Her name was Jennifer and she confirmed my suspicions 
Jeremy had sexually touched her daughter in secret during their relationship. I told her that the same had happened with Lindsay and we both knew that we needed to do something or else he would continue to abuse my child. It was bad enough that he had hurt my own daughter, but to find out that he had done this before and that he had gotten away with it was almost too much for me to take. It made me so incredibly angry and so I created an anonymous account on a few social media websites and posted his pictures along with some rather strong words indicating how he had hurt children in the past and that if you dated him, that you should ask your own children if he hurt them as well. I knew that it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but I was just so mad and I wanted him to pay for what he had done. Not to mention that there was a chance that our daughters weren't his first victims and if he had hurt others, they also deserved to know that would pay for his crimes. After that, I met up with Jennifer and together, so we both met up with our daughters and immediately went to the police. One of the female officers listened to our stories and took us seriously. She sent out officers to the house and arrested Jeremy, who insisted that he was innocent and that his arrest was some kind of mistake. Then he saw me and Jennifer with our daughters, and he realized that I knew what he had been doing. I couldn't help but smile when I saw Jeremy's face and noticed that he had a black eye and a split lip. The police later informed me that Jeremy had been receiving threats from the community, as well as having been attacked a few times by random strangers on the street. It would seem that the community now knew what kind of a monster that he was and had begun to take justice into their own hands. On top of that, the police told us that we weren't the first women to come to the station to report that Jeremy had hurt our daughters. Two other women had come in and filed reports and even had evidence to back up their claims as well. When I asked the officers what would be done to Jeremy now that he was in custody, they winked at me and told me that people like him don't usually have comfortable nights while in jail. Chances were pretty high that a black eye and a split lip would be the least of his problems once the other inmates found out why he had been arrested. The police pressed charges against him and his trial was quick. Because of Lindsay and Jennifer's daughter coming forward to talk about what Jeremy did to them, as well as the two other women. The judge gave him a life sentence and he was taken away. It was all over the news in our town, so if he ever got out, he would never be allowed to forget. I divorced him while he was in prison, and I've been doing my best to move on with my life. Lindsay still has a lot of healing to do, and so does Jennifer and her own daughter. But the process will be a lot easier now that the monster responsible will spend the rest of his life getting exactly what he deserves behind bars.